Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis, a, a new Halloween tradition. I'm uh, Deacon Jonathan Stu Black Arts, and I have with me Dr. David Baden. Uh, last year he joined us to talk about uh, Wes Craven theology. This year he's uh, joining us to talk about theology and vampires. There's a newish volume out of essays, Theology of Vampires. If you're watching this, you will see the link on your screen. If you're listening to this, the link is in the show notes. Dr. Gooden has a essay in this collection of essays called What We Actually Do in the Shadows. And we're going to be talking about some of the interesting connections, links, maybe unfortunate links between the Orthodox tradition and vampire lore and what that has to do with saints and the war of Ukraine. It's really fascinating, folks. <laughs> Thanks so much, David. But of course, uh, David is a professor, he's a theologian, he's a writer, he's been on the show four times. I think it's actually your third Halloween special because we had you on talk with the devil and sins. Recurring host swag bag at some point. So I think my yes. four times, I get a coffee. Cup. The coffee mug says you're going to hell for hanging out with a heretic. David, to dive right in, what inspired you to write this essay? Did you have any interest in like vampire folklore beforehand or fictional vampires or what have you? I guess only a casual interest, being part of popular culture, just experiencing it as a consumer, you got to know about vampires. And then a call for papers happened. So an academia talk, that's a chance to be published. So I jumped at it. It was for this particular volume, Theology and Vampires. And call for papers came out in 2021, like early. I submitted like a proposal in July. It's like over three and a half years for this project to finally come into being. I think the book's officially out in December. So I, I thought about the intriguing, my background is patristics and the Gothic side, the romanticism side, the literature side is not my forte, but the series editor it is. So wonderful opportunity for me to explore something tangential-ish to my main area of study. And so I dove right into it, and then I found, just as Deacon John was talking about, pretty much everything connects to everything else in a really amazing happenstance of history from ancient times to the present day, and the war in Ukraine gets old and involved, as, and other things as well. I think that will come out in this discussion. It was quite an adventure to put it together, and that's what makes writing these types of interdisciplinary work so exciting for an academic. In your essay, you talk about some precursors to the vampire myth. Can you tell us about some of those? Yeah, I tended to focus on Greece for a number of reasons. One, limited limitation of scope. Two, I'm of the Orthodox faith, and there's a lot of Greek Orthodox in it. I started talking to my Greek friends about the Phrykolakis, and their reaction convinced me I need to write about this. Their reaction was deep anger and embarrassment. Uh, imagine if you're from the United States and everyone just assumes everyone in the United States is like Florida man, doing drugs, wrestling gators, and these type of things. This is the reaction of my Greek friends. Oh, that's just superstition of the people who live over there somewhere. I'm here. Okay. The, but the more I dug into it, the more mainstream the thought became to a very embarrassing extent. And in all things Greece, and going directly to your question, I'm not dodging, and I'm not running for office, I'm not going to skip the question, ancient Greece mythology is still alive in different forms. But in ancient Greece, there was a thing called hubris, and which really made the gods mad. And hubris is basically anything that makes the Greek gods mad. It's not necessarily pride. There was the legend of a woman, Polyphonte, who wanted to remain a virgin and just be a companion of Artemis and Aphrodite find that personally offensive, that is hubris, and so curses her for unnatural lust to mate with bears and she'll have monstrous offspring that devour human beings. There's a lot of this going on in Greek mythology. Usually Zeus is up to no good. He seduces someone and then the affront for being seduced and seduced is cleaning up exactly what Zeus actually does to these women, they're turned into undead demonesses that cause crib death or drink blood or somehow associated with a nether world of evil. And there's a lot of it from the Lamia, the Stridges, 
religion of Paul Fonte. It's just, if you do something to make a god mad, like breathe, they can curse you with becoming the undead. Part of that story will be picked up later. I got, I know where some of your questions will be going. Yeah. So you mentioned the the romanticism, the sort of fictional side, the the gothic. That that's not really where your interest lies. And I was wondering if you could talk to due to fiction, we have these very rigid ideas about vampires and rules around yes. them. And uh, again, the literally all meanings of the word romantic ideas about vampires. Um, how are these different from the folklore around vampires? There's a lot of difference and there's a lot of similarity, which is probably the worst answer I can ever give. But let me make it more interesting. Somehow in the back of my brain, I have the memory of a movie I once caught like on cable TV, which was just filling up with old movies. It was from the 1970s. It was called Love at First Bite. So it's a comedy about vampires in New York, and the vampire is trying to steal a girlfriend, and her boyfriend's very upset about this, and figures out he's a vampire, and he confronts the vampire with a Star of David. And the vampire looks and says, I think you need to find him a nice Jewish girl. And he goes, oh, it's the other one, right? The thing is about vampires and why that story is relevant is they're particularly Christian. It is part of Eastern European and Christian lore about the vampires and the cross and burial rites. And so there's a lot of the vampire lore has definitely evolved. The original idea was very ambiguous term that includes both werewolves and ghouls or things we call that today. But also the idea of well, they want to call some havoc among the living, sometimes involving blood. But they're also wanting to eat flesh, too. So what we have today is an evolving lore with many different authors. And one of the interesting points, hopefully interesting points in my research is who is creating this? It turns out to be the creatives, the playwrights, not the church itself. The church has been trying to deal with it unsuccessfully and just people just run with head cannons sometimes about what a vampire is, like in Greece today. They still believe in Vrykolakas, but they believe it could be anything. It could be a werewolf, it could be an image, and sometimes they just strangle people. They're not necessarily, I'm going to drink your blood, that sort of deal. They're just really angry, undead people who have some sort of agenda against the living, sometimes from their death was not avenged, so they're just going to avenge themselves on anybody. It can be almost anything. Again, with the idea of headcanon, you just make up a story that makes sense and blame it on a vampire. That kind of happens. You mentioned how this is a Christian mythology. Yes. But you mentioned some pre-Christian antecedents. But who is the angel Karos? Okay. Awesome question, because it's very self-serving to my needs. Every culture has something that goes bump in the night. From India to Iceland, somebody has something about the undead. Undoubtedly, Herbert Spencer, one of the early theorists about religion, where it comes from, dreams of the dead. There must be a world. Uncle Joe came to me in a dream. I'm an ancient person. I really don't know what dreams are. Maybe they're alive in some sort of other existence because Uncle Joe is still talking to me in my dreams. So every world culture has something. And some are more vampire-like than others. So uh, there's an interesting one, Lilith, within Judaism, which some people call a vampire, but not really. But let's hold that aside. So Sharos is actually the ancient Greek figure of Sharon, the ferryman of the dead. And so in the ancient Greek myths, coming mostly out of the playwrights of you have an underworld, you got to get to Hades. How do you actually get there? You have the pre-existing lore of the river, river Lake and Archeon and these other rivers. You need a boatman. As so it appears in Greek mythology, just we need a guy there. But over these centuries, Sharon gets a much more important uh, role in dealing with the dead and taking from point A to point B, such that you even have popes today buried with coins, which I don't know if it made you have to cut down a paper. But literally, popes are buried with bags of coins because of the ferryman of the dead thing. Think that Rim Reaper has an Uber driver. That is Sharon. And it's good to tip. And so 
that is part of ancient Greek lore. It's going to continue in Christianity through some very intentional things and unintentional things and continuing lore, uh, such that today, in Greece today, it has morphed, I don't know if that's the right word, or evolved. Charon, it sounds better in Greek to be Charos, because that's a guy's name. And he's now an angel who takes, when you die, you have a weight, which is for the people to deal with the fact that Uncle Joe has passed away. You gather together, you cry, you give eulogies. But the idea that emerged is the soul is trapped in the body. And if it's not released from the body, it's going to stay in the body, in the ground, and then come up out of the ground as a Rikolakis vampire. So the angel Sharon has to appear, literally cut the throat with this great sigh, invisibly, and release the soul from the body so the angel Sharon can then take him to heaven, rather than to Hades in the ancient Greek myth. It is just utterly fascinating, and I would argue, not a coincidence, there is no angel Sharos. It's only a Greek thing, and it's taken out of their own mythology. You need to get from point A to point B. You need an Uber driver. Let's just call him Sharos. Yeah, he's the uncomfortable part. You ask someone from Greece, ah, that's those, yeah, it's a little bit more prevalent. It's a little bit more mainstream. Like, one of the things I'll mention, I'm maybe heading off a question or not, but one of the first things I discovered in my research is, well, during World War II, in Greece, there was the Great Famine when the, Allied, the Axis powers had occupied Greece, and the Allied powers, we can't let the bad guys get supplies. They blockaded Greece, and so the Greek people starved. And eventually they had to break the blockade, but not before 300,000 people died. That's a lot of people. So many people, you couldn't bury them in consecrated ground and rape. You couldn't have funeral rites for them all because there were just so many dead at one point. It was mass great. It was documented people beheaded their loved ones to keep them coming back from coming back as vampires if they had to go with the mass graves. And this ain't that long ago, World War II, and it's such a prevalent myth that, yeah, you loved Uncle Joe, but I'm not that eager to see him. I'm going to be desecrate a corpse of a loved one because of this superstition. And the church has not been able to eradicate that is like the title of the my article chapter what we actually do in the shadows is hinting at that this is a greek orthodox country that doesn't believe in superstition but yeah it's there there's charos there is the belief in vampires there's literally priestly rites to do over the grave of the dead if the people think it's a vampire the priest is no priest will bless any that's not a problem and the own canon law says this is for the benefit of the people the devil's playing tricks with their minds. There are no vampires. But go over there and sh throw some holy water around and say a trisagon for the dead. And the people go, think, because superstition is the evil caused by the devil. But the people still believe it. And the priest, the smart ones know it's, this is called placebo. Wessie, yeah, Uncle Joe's staying down. You're good. Yes, so. It's psychological, it makes people feel better, only takes yes. a minute, why not? So the, but the canons aren't saying, you have to do this to fight vampires. They're saying, exactly. it, it'll give the people some relief. Go for it. Yeah, so it's a good thing, and you work on their edification and education later, but in the meantime, you don't want the peasantry digging up their dead ones and desecrating graves, because it's a church of the resurrection. And it's, go throw some holy water around, do some prayers to the mother of God, and you're good. Yeah, you're, you're, you're avoiding a, uh, a decapitated corpse and a stake through the heart. So It just occurred to me, if you search for images of grave sites and vampires, you'll see there was another option. You could bury your dead with one of those sickles, so if they try to get out of the grave, they'll decapitate themselves. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> well, it's very clever. It's, it's very clever. clever. Because it's a curved way to just put it over them, and it's not by doing. If he tries to get up, he's going to chop his own head off. So right, it's almost like the, the Looney Tunes answer, right. <laughs> Yeah, I think it says Acme on the side of the sickle. <laughs> Shit. Okay, that's my own thing. You discuss how St. John of Damascus viewed vampire myths as a mockery of the Eucharist. Yeah, this is something I'd actually argue that, different tangent, 
the dra the author of Dracula, Bram Stoker, who's a Protestant, actually picks up on in, in this novel. But could you elaborate on this, this theological tension? We were just talking about it, but elaborate more between Orthodox ritual, folk beliefs about blood drinking, this connection to the Eucharist, if you could tie that all together in a bow for us. Yes. So there's this guy, St. John of Damascus, who turns out to be a really big name. He's the figure that will defend icons in particular in the history of Christianity, ratified it ecumenical. He's like one of the biggest names in the church. And the point of why I'm stressing that is he had better things to do. And yet he was felt drawn to write an essay of, to those people who believe in these sturges, these witch-like vampires, let me just address this. Meanwhile, I'm fighting heretics about icons, defending the mother of God. Okay, let's deal with this. And it, the essay kind of boils down to, as context uh, in Christianity, Holy Communion, Eucharist, Last Supper, that sacrament is the bread and the wine becomes the body and blood of Christ, and that's the medicine of immortality that helps you to be raised from the dead unto paradise itself. And somehow, either as a deliberate troll or based on peasant imagination, if there is body and blood for everlasting life unto God, the devil must have the say, the body and the blood for everlasting life as the undead. And this is what John Damascus writes, is a mockery of the Eucharist to confuse the simple-minded and have them do unmeet acts of superstition, of desecrating their own loved ones when they're dead. And come on guys it's they're literally making fun of you christians are in there drinking blood devil must have the same thing or they're just making fun of christians you think this is going to give you everlasting life and literally we'll have a vampire jump out of you as a parody as a cruel parody of that whatever the original tension was and how it emerged no one knows because the recesses of history people just accepted it without thought yeah that makes sense <laughs> The devil's got one too. They want to drink blood. The modern vampire myth doesn't have that much about eating, but originally the word vampire included werewolves or at least shape-shifting into a wolf from blood drinking vampire to a werewolf. So John of Damascus says, and occasionally I, it's one of the reasons I love patristics. You find the church fathers say, yeah, I don't want to call you an idiot, but they get <laughs> right. into it would be odd, Christian, to call you an idiot, but... Yes. Yeah. But that's fascinating, and I think it really hammers home your, your earlier point, where even though there, there may be pagan influence, pagan antecedents, it's, it's really a Christian mythology, right? Yeah. For better or for worse, and for worse, as we're going to keep discussing. But yes. the transformation of vampire mythology after the fall of Constantinople in 1450, how did the Ottoman occupation influence the Greek Orthodox Church's interpretation of the Boer Kalak? And, and what does this have to do with heretics? Yes. Here I rely on other scholarship, meaning I couldn't quite independently confirm it, but the, the scholar uh, whose name just escapes my mind argues that as an extra incentive uh, to stay Christian and not give into apostasy under Islamic occupation, that if you renounce Christ, Christ will renounce you and you'll become this revenant, this undead thing where you're not only excommunicated from the church, but excommunicated from heaven itself, forever trapped to live in the, the decaying flesh of your own body. And so the claim is it was an extra warning not to apostatize when Islamic invaders say, it's your choice, but I have a sword. <laughs> so choose wisely. Yeah. So a fate worse than death awaits you if you renounce Christ. Regardless of how that began to emerge, it gets established that going to Greek, not so much today, but at least in the 17th century, that if you were a heretic, if you renounce Christ, if you apostatize your faith, you would be a vampire. And the thing is, <laughs> forgive me, Greek people. I... God, I feel like I, I am going not to have spin with spinacopita ever again after I say this. But in the 17th century, at least, pretty much anything can get you accused of being a vampire, particularly if you're born on the wrong day. So if you're born on Christmas Day, you did that personally as an affront to God, and therefore to teach you a lesson they 
burn off your nails in fire. So they put your hands in fire to, you, you're a bad person because you chose the wrong day to be born. Or if they thought your mother conceived you on a day dedicated to the mother of God. So literally any excuse, you could be a vampire. And it's not just Greece. And being accused of being a witch still happens in parts of Africa in particular too. So many people do have these superstitions. It's getting lesser in the 21st century. I haven't heard any of these stories of people. You are feast stricken. <laughs> Your mother and father got naughty at the wrong time and therefore you were cursed of God and we have to do something to punish you for it. Superstition just grows upon itself. But under the Islamic occupation, there's going to be this other development that one of the last holdout areas will be a place called Transylvania in Romania and in Hungary and in Moldova. And you will have several valiant Romer crusaders, but fighters against Islamic occupation and the figures of Vlad Taylor and Stefan the Great in Moldova. And I think you have a question heading in that direction, so I'll just turn it back over to you. Yeah, it's too long to, to title the show with. If you're ever looking for a future title for a book, it's What Does Dracula and His Cousin Have to Do with Problematic Saints? Yes. Oof. I was in Greece like two years ago at a conference, and it's, oh my God, wonderful. And I go into this wonderful Greek church, and I see something I've never seen in a church before, weapons. There's a reliquary with a sword next to it. That is odd. Then I start looking at the icons. They literally have icons of saints killing people. St. Demetrius of Thessaloniki is holding a spear and killing a guy, and he's on the kind of stasis of the church. And I'm here, where's turn the other cheek in Christ in this? Yeah, I'm from North America. Europe has a lot more experience with religious wars. And what will begin to happen to church is the people want, need, and crave war heroes. That's fine. Every nation in the world has a tomb to the unknown soldier. I've been to the one. As soon as I became a Canadian citizen, I go to Ottawa, go this. You can have your heroes who fight for truth, justice, protection of the innocent, uh, doing your patriotic duty, whatever it is, this is a good thing. It doesn't make them holy. But for people fighting against the threat of being another religion, this idea of you're doing it not just to protect your neighbors, you're doing it for God. And St. Demetrius of Thessaloniki never killed anyone in real life. The own hagiographies about him says, no, he was a good Christ-fearing person. He just blessed someone who was about to go into combat. So in the imagination of the people, he's the protector of the city of Thessaloniki who had to fight to remain orthodox against a number of invaders from Ottoman Turks to pagans. And therefore, somehow he's now shown as you're the guy to pray to protect you from enemies. And relationships between Greece and Turkey are still, they still rattle their sabers at each other. Apparently, there's been a bending of the will of the people, of bending the will of the church to, we'll paint the icon this way. Even though we know it's not the reality, St. Demetrius never killed anybody. But he's literally spearing and cut another human being in terror to death. It's a really gruesome thing to see in a church dedicated to Christ, love your enemies, turn the other cheek, give them your cloak when they rob you. This type, not quite the same Christianity. And so this goes with the lionization of these war heroes. And there's two of them particularly at least factor into my research, my paper. One is contemporaries and cousins of Vlad the Impaler of Wallachia and Stefan the Great of Moldova. And they fought together, they fought alongside. And guess what? They did the same thing of impaling people alive as a weapon of terror. The only difference is one of the things that Vlad the Third of Wallachia did is he goes into Hungary and he takes out a city mostly inhabited by German Catholics. When that gets back to Germany, they're going to write a lot of pamphlets about 
there's this bloodthirsty saint in Wallachia. His name is Dracula, and he drinks blood. So he had a deliberate propaganda, get the troops angry, get the Catholics mad at the Orthodox, that will stick. Stead in the Grace doing the same thing. He, he actually uh, impaled people in a different way. you got to be rigid. Rather than the Vlad way from tailbone to shoulder, they did it. He did it through the belly button and stacked them crosswise on top of each other. It's a more efficient use of wood, so maybe he was ecologically minded. One day, he can bet many people. But yeah, the Turks hated him. They said he was more evil than the devil himself. In 1997, because he's a national hero of Moldova, and that's a country, Moldavia, they pronounced, spell it, both spellings are correct. 1997, not that long ago, they made him a saint. Just because of, we love our country, we love our history, we love our people, he's a defender of our country, we still got Vladimir Putin out there looking at us from cross-eyed, so we need a great defender. And there's legends about Stefan the Great who will rise from the grave on Judgment Day and lead Moldavia in a triumphant battle against the Antichrist. So he's still, he's got this vampire-ish in popular culture imagination, someone coming back from that, but he's the good guy. Well, I had the yeah. third as the son of the devil, and but their cousin's doing the exact same thing. And national heroes are fine, doesn't make them holy people. That People just want to conflate things, and I think for most people it is. It, actually, in Ottawa, I think there was a couple of years ago, some drunk kids did some profane things to the tomb of the unknown soldier in Ottawa, and it was quite a national scandal because it hits the same place of offense as if you would, you know, vandalize a church or destroy the Bible, that sort of thing. Christianity is not about this world, it's the world to come. And the desire to make this world into a military kingdom of God is really a wrong-headed thing. And Vladimir Putin is literally using this language of, I'm here fighting the armies of the Antichrist by invading Ukraine because Bible. Who knows if he actually believes this? The thing is, a lot of the Russian people do. So this is where this rhetoric suddenly gets really real and dangerous. And that's right, right. Yeah. But I was just going to say, keep talking about that because we're tying together these folk beliefs, these saints, these mm -hmm. nationalist heroes, the Orthodox Church, and Putin. The, the, like, this is uh, real world stuff, right? And it's having the dramatic impacts in, in the world that we live in now. So it's not charming folk beliefs. It's not old legends. It's not uh, funky yeah. saints. People are literally dying today. I have a brand new article that came out like, like two or three days ago. It's the rhetoric out of Putin of. I am here to fight the Antichrist, and people are dying by the hundreds of thousands because of this religious vision. And he has a lot of people rooting for him in Western countries because they believe that it, it, if you believe in human rights, you must be the devil. So, yeah, the Western culture, this of this, and LGBTQ plus people, and abortion rights, they see Putin as a godlike figure doing Christian things and murdering his neighbors who are also Christian. It, the religious thinking really has people not thinking and just reacting as if like, the best thing to do is desecrate your bodies of the dead, best thing for you to do is invade your neighboring countries, and it's only going to get worse. So yeah, my article was what we actually do in the shadows, leaked to the TV show, but there's some serious real-world repercussions out of that that do leak my other article uh, to this podcast. Yeah. I get no money out of it. I'm an academic. I get no money at all, ever. Did. Yeah. Yeah, people really don't realize that, that they see these really expensive uh, academic tomes, and they're like, these people must be raking it in. This book's 200 bucks. It's somebody getting money, not me. Can you discuss how Elizabeth uh, Kostova's novel, The Historian, captures something true about the Orthodox Church's uncomfortable relationship with historical antiheroes? How accurately do you think this book and modern vampire fiction reflects these historical and theological tensions? 
her work in particular, and I was actually looking right before our this online event, it's going to be made into a movie. Apparently, she sold the movie rights, but it somehow it's just lingering somewhere in Hollywood. They got too many other films to put out. The way she frames it, spoilers, but what it's trying to me, the book is like, the main protagonist is literally an academic researcher. Oh my God, I'm in. I can relate to this stuff. And as the deeper they go, the more they find out about what is really happening and what is the relationship of the church. I just think like Da Vinci Code, but Dracula is like the idea there's a conspiracy, there's secret documents, there's things, and there are scenes in the novel where the researcher and dream or reality visits visits uh, Vlad in some sort of netherworld and he has an entire library, he claims that he has all the scholarly books to deliver to him and he particularly likes the, says so waiting for his time to return. So accidentally or otherwise building on this myth of Stephen the Great is gonna return to fight the Antichrist on Judgment Day. Something like that is in there. Vlad is just waiting for the right time to return, and he particularly hates his life. So there's that as well. So can't wait for the movie. It's a wonderful book, has quite a fan base, and it is probably uncomfortable enough to make... What am I about... Oh, my God. So the thing about the Da Vinci Code really made Catholics angry. It'd be really interesting if that's the same thing when this is finally made into a movie. The Orthodox get really uncomfortable. Hey, we hate him too. Not so much. He's still a kind of a anti-hero in Romania today, Vlad the Third. Yeah, he was a bad guy, but he was our bad guy, and he killed a lot of worse guys. So he's not that bad. So yeah, it it has that chance to expose you. Orthodox seem to be purgy uh, anti-heroes of history rather the true heroes of faith, which are actually saints that cared for lepers and were pacifists unto death and just witnessed Christ, holy carp in the Colosseum being devoured by flames. This is what Christianity historically celebrated rather than people with swords in their hands. So what happened to Christianity and why are suddenly you like war heroes? I think these are good questions to ask. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's really important. And actually, th that brings me to my final question, which you basically already answered a, a few times throughout the talk. But I just want to, in an academic paper, you start with the thesis, you end with the thesis. And I think everything makes sense and connects well, right? But we've covered everything from Zeus to the Ottomans to Dracula to modern vampires. There's, there's a lot of threads there. So if you could put it all together for us, what does some pagan-derived folk beliefs the church tolerates have to do with warrior saints. Why is this a corruption of the Orthodox tradition? Why does it matter for the modern day? So, I don't know how well I'm at succinct. Let's give it a try. I think I'm like too busy self censoring. Christianity sees itself as the light of truth, illuminating the minds of those who have previously been in ignorance of uh, following after pagan gods given into idolatry. And so very much the Christian project has been to put away your childish things and accept the real thing, which is Christ. In essence, the mission of the church, historically speaking, was to eradicate paganism, superstition, and replace it with literally orthodox, true teaching. That wasn't successful, not fully. You still have Sharon running around in Greece today, and he ain't an angel. He's just coming out of your own culture's mythology, things that Christianity was supposed to replace. And so the thesis is the Christian project was never fully successful of converting the people to the Orthodox faith. And moreover, the Orthodox faith has bent to the will of the people by, let's just have rights over the grave in case there's a vampire. We know it's not real. And it's good for the people because they can sleep well at night but they never really follow up on teaching this not real because some of the interviews I looked at, people say, I hear about in church. There is a Vrykolakis and he's out. there. It's not fully successful. And this corruption ends up with military saints and Russia is literally filled with military saints who never did anything Christian in their lives, except defend their nation. Great thing. But 
nothing Christian about them, but somehow that's the same in the minds of the people today. And very much the Russian Orthodox Church today as a cathedral dedicated to war. It's literally made out of melted Nazi tanks. I am not exaggerating. They had lots of Nazi tanks in Russia. They melted them down, use it part of their cathedral dedicated to the armed forces, including nuclear war. And that's where they keep their icons. And they take them to the battlefields to inspire the troops to die by the thousands in human wave attacks because they're promised to place in heaven if you die this way. So yeah, that's the corruption of the Christian faith. And so hopefully I can shine a light of, to those who call themselves Christian, there is no half measures. You're not going to go all the way in combating superstition because you like to have fuel, all the pews filled, but you can't do that by catering to nonsense at the same time. The six, the six, the six. Yeah, that's amazing. The book again, folks, is Theology and Vampires. As we already discuss, discussed, uh, academic books can be quite expensive, but what you can do is request it at your library. Uh, they can order it in, and you can read it that way. There's a whole bunch more essays. They all look fascinating. I can't wait to get a copy. Uh, they put that... PDF I just uh, sent to Deacon John. That will be linked in this. Perfect. People that read the PDF, go to the links we're going to put in the show notes. Thanks again for joining us for Halloween, David. Uh, I really appreciate you wearing your Luke Skywalker The Last Jedi costume. It's excellent. So we will speak to you again maybe sooner than 365 days, but who knows? Yeah, at least next Halloween. I'll try to have something spooky for then as well. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dave. Thank you.